Our second speaker today uh, works, broadly speaking, at the intersection of Marxism and feminism. She is a cultural critic, social theorist, philosopher, and translator. Translator, I mentioned that uh, before. She, for example, co-edited and translated Alain Badiou on Beckett with Alberto Toscano, who spoke yesterday. Our guest today gained very wide recognition with her book, One Dimensional Woman, which uh, was a pun, of course, on Herbert Marcuse, One Dimensional uh, Man here in Germany. It appeared in 2009 and was translated in many languages. It actually uh, was published at Merve Verlag here in Germany. You can still get it. It was, some say, a feminist critique of feminism, of a feminism deep in the fabric of capitalism, to be a little bit more precise. What looks like emancipation is nothing but the tightening of the shackles, it said, at least in consumer or self-help feminism. Power also worked as a tutor in critical writing in art and design at the Royal College of Art. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Art and a member of the British Philosophical Association, while contributing once in a while to media like The Guardian. She's a senior lecturer of philosophy at University of Roehampton, located in the southwest of London. Today she will speak, already hinted at that a little bit, philosophy as self-defense. Very happy she's with us today. Welcome, Nina Power. Mm. Right. Um, well, fortunately, my, my talk is sort of uh, fairly on the short side. Ah, don't do that. <laughs> um, seriously. <laughs> um, uh, so it's and it's going to be a bit looser uh, than some of the other papers, which were like very well researched and scholarly. And in that sense, it might be um, also a little bit more open and and probably uh, full of uh, provocative things that I didn't mean to say, um, <laughs> as is the case. Um, so I don't have any images, and, and this is partly, I mean, this is, this is a deliberate decision, not just that I ran out of time and couldn't think of any, but um, because one of my other projects at the moment is, to, is a long-term thing about, about uh, trying to think about the violence of the image uh, as such and, as, and images of violence, which is obviously a kind of you know, huge uh, uh, question about how we understand uh, what we see and how it works on us, as it were. Does it work to stultify or does it work to mobilize, to rouse us? Um, you know, and I think that, that obviously has already um, come up um, in Vanessa's uh, paper uh, a, a lot. And so I didn't want to get too deeply into that uh, question, um, but rather ask a, a couple of different questions. Um, and so in the first place, I wanted to talk about um, philosophy's approach to violence uh, and the police. And obviously, again, this will be very schematic because, of course, philosophy has said many things about uh, violence uh, and, and slightly uh, less uh, specifically about the police, although it has, of course, talked about the police uh, as well. Um, and then I want to try to talk about what it might mean to think of philosophy as a form of self-defense. Um, so when we think about violence, uh, we perhaps first and foremost, or more, most immediately, uh, think of violence as an action, as something, or a series of actions, as something done by somebody or, 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 or a group um, to an individual or to another group. Um, but the emphasis is on a kind of uh, an action in the first place. Um, by an agent of the state, by, by structures and institutions. Of course, we think also about structural violence, um, but also by inaction, the failure to save someone or a group of people. Uh, and of course, this is very, very relevant when we're thinking about uh, how the, the police uh, behave uh, and the question of the bystander, uh, for example, when does one uh, intervene and, and those situations in which people decide not to uh, intervene, for example. And this raises, uh, again, the question that Vanessa uh, mentioned about care and protection. What does it mean to live in a community in which care and protection are kind of constitutive modes of being uh, together? And that would include protecting oneself, protecting the other, um, but also protecting somebody from their own self-destruction as well, which is, you know, requires a great deal of courage uh, in, in many cases, um, as well as protecting them uh, from, from the state. Um, we might wonder about the causes of violence, these, these forms of violence, police training on the one hand, um, but also uh, 
where does interpersonal violence come from, um, as well as state violence? We might think of various modalities of being and, emo and emotional feeling, uh, perhaps ignorance, misogyny, racism, personal or national gain, territorial disputes, you know, the difference between something like a kind of motive, a commercial motive, and something like a kind of emotional uh, motive, uh, a very, very complicated uh, scale, uh, often uh, reduced too quickly uh, to the idea of hate, the hate of the other, you know, and if we don't understand, if we don't try to understand and unpick what we're talking about, uh, when we uh, when we when we describe someone as hate-filled, for example, or a group as hate-filled, uh, we are really uh, in trouble. And and of course, this means confronting uh, very deeply and and very uh, with great difficulty um, uh, negative feelings that we ourselves might uh, carry. And and in a sense that this is to one side, but it's also a kind of psychoanalytic uh, question, really about thinking about aggression uh, and, and passivity. And I'm not going to talk too much about that. But as Thomas Hobbes puts it in uh, his, his Leviathan from 1651, obviously this kind of, you know, it, uh, sort of initial classic of political philosophy uh, that discusses the state of nature, discusses uh, what life might be without government, without the state, um, he says this, in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Second, Secondly, diffidence, and here Hobbes means mistrust rather than shyness, which is maybe how we uh, think about diffidence today. So mistrust, so competition, mistrust, and thirdly, glory, he says. So these are the kind of, for Hobbes, the three principal causes of antagonism, of quarrel. He says, the first maketh man invade for gain, the second for, sa for safety, and the third for reputation. The first use violence to make themselves masters of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. The second to defend them. The third for trifles, as a word, a smile, a different opinion, and any other sign of undervalue, either direct in their persons or by reflection in their kindred, their friends, their nation, their profession, or their name. So reputation, in a certain sense. Hobbes says, hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war. And such a war is as is of every man against every man. Okay, famously. So hence for Hobbes, the necessity for the construction of the covenant, the social construct, to give up the fact that in the state of nature, where everyone has an equality of sorts, Hobbes says, despite what we might assume about this kind of very differentiated uh, state, because every man and woman and child is free to use whatever is at his disposal, that's a form of equality, um, whether it be intelligence or weapons or, or might, for example, uh, so strength, um, of a place and time in which, quote, nothing can be unjust. Okay, so the state of in the state of nature, nothing can be unjust, Hobbes says. That is to say, uh, in, in this state, the notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, have there no place, he says. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. The rise of the polis, therefore, the city of the, the covenant, the kind of the sovereign nation, if you like, uh, in, in Hobbes's terms, is at the same time then the invention of justice, in this sense, therefore of law and of the violence of law, as Walter Benjamin discusses, of morality, or at least a makeshift version of norms suitable for the state to promote, and whose transgression must therefore be punished either by the state or socially in terms of ostracization, social death, punishment, so on, and of those structures and bodies that emerge to protect these two things, um, that, that is to say, to protect justice and morality, namely the police, uh, whose word itself traces its root from the Greek polis, so the city-state, through the Latin politia, city administration. Um, so we end up with a technocratic institution, right, the police, um, tasked with upholding abstract ideas that emerge with the invention of the state uh, through violent means, uh, as of course now it is only the state that classically, famously, has the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence in Weber's description, um, and as anyone, because, I mean, as, as Hobbes points out, let's just say, you know, what you give up 
um, when giving up the state of nature in order for in, in, in return for state protection is also your right to use violence yourself right it's a very complicated question in some countries but um, you have a minimal right to self-defense if someone attacks you but otherwise everything is left up to the state it's the state that kind of distributes owns decides and determines what violence is and will punish you if you then use it uh, yourself as anyone who, who has ever attempted to get the state to recognize the harm it has itself committed right whether this is police behavior or anything else it is clear that this blind spot and resistance is constitutive of the, of the makeup of the state there is no justice there's just us as one chant of families of those killed by the police, United Family and Friends organization in the UK has it. There is no justice, there's just us. At the same time, the invention of the police police is also the construction of a particular kind of identity, a certain kind of self, a certain kind of subject. Okay, and we've, interpolation has already been mentioned, the hailing of the subject uh, by the police, um, but also in relation to the self in my title, um, and I'll come back to this in a second in, re in reference to, to Fichte. So this self that, that is constructed by uh, the state, this particular kind of identity, the state being that you are in a certain sense, is not the self of my title, the self that philosophy might protect against the state through its various modes of self-defense. Um, in other words, and, and this is a kind of question, how do we protect ourselves against the state of all kinds, and I include the kinds of internal policing also that one finds even amongst those who oppose themselves to official police, as well as the policemen in our own heads, as the 60s slogan had it. As my dear comrade Alfie Meadows hit by a, a police truncheon during the student protest against fee increases and cuts in 2010, uh, which required life-saving brain surgery, and then Alfie was himself charged with violent disorder, and this was a line he said when we were out uh, drinking once, he said, the moment the policeman hit me on the head was the moment that the policeman in my, in the, in my head was killed. Um, <laughs> there are many traps of policing, though, and of punishing. We engage, we might say, in police behaviour ourselves very often, even or especially with people close to us. Uh, even something like the silent treatment, for example, like where we might punish someone that we love uh, by not speaking to them, you know, as a form of kind of withholding uh, one sort of being with uh, somebody else, of withholding uh, dialogue as a way of kind of inducing negative or bad feeling uh, in the other, you know. And so that kind of question of punishment I think has to sort of begin, you know, as close to us as we can imagine, and not and not for us to just think, oh, punishment is simply prisons. Punishment is simply what the state does. Um, you know, we internalise constantly uh, these forms of policing and punishment, um, and it's a difficult thing to try to to live uh, with and beyond and to critique uh, in oneself uh, and in one's group and in one's relationship. As Deleuze and Guattari put it in 1980s, A Thousand Plateaus in the section 1933, micropolitics and segmentarity, we are trapped in a thousand little monomanias, self-evident truths and clarities that gush from every black hole and no longer form a system, but are only rumble and buzz, blinding lights giving any and everybody the mission of self-appointed judge, dispenser of justice, policeman, neighborhood SS man. We have overcome fear, they say, we have sailed from the shores of security, only to enter a system that is no less concentricized, no less organized, the system of petty insecurities that leads everyone to their own black hole in which to turn dangerous, possessing a clarity on their situation, role, and mission, even more disturbing than the certitudes of the first line. Uh, in other words, uh, social media today. Um, to return briefly to the question of what kind of identity the state needs or induces or constructs, I think we must first understand briefly the philosophy of identity, what it means to think about identity, and indeed the identity of philosophy uh, as such when it tries to tackle these kind of questions. Um, in an article from 2013 entitled Fichte's Passport, a, Phil a Philosophy of the P Police, uh, by Gregory uh, Chamayou, who also wrote the Drone Theory book, very interesting thinker, he says this, in 1797, the philosopher Fichte descended one time from the heights of speculative philosophy, setting aside the abstract dance of the ego and the non-ego, 
in order to propose concrete measures, police measures. Victor writes in the Foundations of Natural Right that, quote, the principal maxim of every well-constituted police power must be the following. Every citizen must be readily identifiable wherever necessary as this or that particular person. Police officers must be able to establish the identity of every subject. So this is Victor's uh, image of what the police uh, should be. Shamayu continues, the immediate consequence of this principle of identification, or rather of police identifiability, was a new system of passports. Everyone, and he's quoting Victor again, everyone must always carry a passport with him, issued by the nearest authority and containing a precise description of his person. Uh, this applies to everyone, regardless of class or rank, with the further specification that, quote, since merely verbal descriptions of a person always remain ambiguous, it might be good if important persons, who therefore can afford it as well, were to carry accurate portraits in their passports rather than descriptions. Okay, so this kind of self and identity, I mean, in a sense, of course, this is the world in which we live, whether it's uh, if we own a passport or whether we have a Facebook profile or any of these kinds of things, this form of police identifiability or identifiability as such, in which we kind of often just give, freely give up vast quantities of uh, information that we also think uh, tells you something about uh, who we are, whether it's an official or an unofficial documentation. In a sense, we live absolutely uh, in this, this world. And, and this kind of uh, uh, relation between self and identity that Victor describes in the modality of the police um, is a kind of co-terminality of like one-on-one -on -one correspondence between our self as a state self and a kind of inner self or ego. There's no difference uh, anymore. There's nothing kind of hidden, if you like. Uh, it's a kind of disruption of a sort of inside-outside uh, uh, relation. Um, so this is one, just one example, and a very unusual one in certain ways, of the way in which philosophy might talk about a particular kind of uh, self, a self as a kind of um, identity. Um, and again, I want to s stress that, you know, the, the kind of self that I'm talking about in relation to uh, the philosophy, philosophy as a kind of self-defense, uh, would also require a kind of, uh, I don't know, a sort of, a confronting of the desire for identity in the first place and perhaps a kind of dissolution um, or destruction of that kind of identity, the one that is imposed by the state, but also the one that we might impose on ourselves and others when we constantly say that we are X, uh, we are X, Y, Z, uh, A, B, C, um, you know, and, and, and in, in its place, a sort of kind of no self, a kind of absence of, of self, but merely a form of being, um, which, which sounds kind of uh, strange in a certain way. Um, I'm going to turn a little bit to talk then about um, philosophy as, as self-defense then. And of course, in the background here, um, in the Western tradition, I mean, Socrates uh, comes to mind almost uh, immediately as the kind of the provocateur, the gadfly, uh, the person who is a kind of joker and a martyr at the same time, uh, the supreme ironist uh, who cannot kind of be um, assimilated by the state and in a sense has to be kind of put to death whether he actually dies or not. But in Plato's dialogues, you know, of course, Socrates is, is charged with corrupting the youth of uh, making the weaker argument defeat the stronger uh, and various other things um, and it's Socrates kind of figure in a certain sense you know he's the kind of Christ of philosophy um, in his uh, sort of methods and techniques um, that he kind of seeks to sort of completely undermine if you like any of those forms of identity in on the one hand uh, but also of the state's uh, claim uh, to cover the whole, the idea that the state somehow um, has the sort of has the monopoly on anything, whether it's violence uh, or thinking or being, um, you know, and, and we can think about sort of strategies of of, of irony, of aporia, of confusion, of leading uh, young men in particular into states uh, where they they begin to question uh, everything about their own status, their own values, uh, and so on, and what it means actually uh, instead to think freely um, and and to kind of undermine and question one's own initial presuppositions, um, and so philosophy, philosophy then. It is not kind of reducible to Socrates, um, although perhaps it perhaps it might be uh, in a certain way. Um, 
But one thing I want to say about this idea of self-defence, so as opposed to thinking about violence in the first place, obviously it's very important to think about violence as, as aggression, as acts of aggression, as acts of, of torture, of sexualised violence, of, of war. You know, in a sense, we can't not think about violence in that way. Um, but what might it mean then to think about using the enemy's violence against them? So the idea of a kind of self-defence or response to uh, violence. If one is being uh, attacked, one also... Uh, wants to defend oneself, and, and this may also be a preemptive uh, self-defence, you know, and, and the defence is here of oneself, but also of a group or of philosophy. The self is a very floating, has a very floating meaning in the way that I, I'm talking about it. Um, and it seems to me that philosophy, of, of course, has things directly to say about what violence is and how we might think about violence, um, and I don't think it's opposed to say, oh, well, if we're thinking about violence, then we're not acting about violence. I think we need to have both thinking and action. I think action without thought um, is liable to create kind of uh, serious uh, problems, uh, actually, even when we feel a sense of urgency. And this is one of the very difficult questions about political action in general, is what do you do when the feeling of injustice, state injustice, of state punishment, of state terror, creates such an immediate feeling that one must respond, that one must do something. You know, this line, something must be done, you know, we must do something. How is it possible in that moment to also uh, take uh, a pause to think about strategy, about what it is that must be done in the name of what and who and why? Uh, a very, very difficult question because, the, in a sense, the time itself belongs to the state. Uh, and when we respond on the state's time, uh, we also kind of fall into their traps. And think about what prison is. I mean, prison, for example, is nothing other than, you know, the stealing of a block of your finite existence. You know, it's the state saying, all your time belongs to us, you know, and the state will take years. It, it will never resolve anything because it doesn't have to. It has all the time on its side. It knows that people will die. It knows that people will give up fighting. It knows that people will uh, get tired it, and so on. And, and, and so there is a kind of another question behind this paper, which is also to do with our concept of time and how we actually have a concept of time that opposes state time and how do we... Uh, let's say, uh, in the, what's the Joseph Conrad novel where the anarchist goes to Greenwich meantime and blows, tries to blow up Greenwich meantime. And something like this, but on a kind of deeper, deeper level, how do we destroy state time? And I've written about this, this elsewhere. Um, okay, but then, so how do we use the enemy's violence against them, right? This, this idea of, of self-defense, whether it's preemptive or uh, in the moment. Well, in the first place, by using thought and the freedom of thought and association against all of those who would seek to prescribe what can and can't be thought, which is what the state spends much of its time doing one way or another, and think about all of the agencies of the state, the branches of the state, culture, for example. Can I say that? Yes. Um, so culture in the sense, the way in which it kind of uh, overwhelmingly, not all culture, but um, much of it, uh, seeks to, to disrupt, disrupt and destroy thought to lead to confusion, uh, separation, atomization, and alienation. Um, the way in which the, stem, the state and culture prevent communication is seek to prevent communication with those deemed unspeakable uh, or unspeakable to, I should say, which is to, to say those supposed to be outside of legitimate discourse according to the state. Uh, we could think of the mad, we could think of children. They say the funniest things, um, but we're not really supposed to listen to them. Um, but also to those who are unacceptable to the thinking of the day, so whoever uh, might be Socrates today, and there, there are kind of thousands of Socrates uh, in a certain sense. Um, and I think it is here that philosophy as a method of calm reflection, uh, believe it or not, um, of unpicking what is perhaps going on in any claim, in any position, especially one that, that claims to have the kind of uh, an essence or, or particularly uh, claims to know what the sort of solution is and that the solution must be violent in a certain sense. Um, so philosophy is a kind of method that sort of seeks to understand both emotion and thought. And, and as Spinoza said, these are really just two different ways of looking at the same thing. You know, to understand one can have a kind of map of emotions just as one could have a map of thinking, and we mustn't think, in a sense, that they're so radically different. Um, of what it means to perhaps to put oneself in the shoes of the other, especially the other who says things that we find uh, intolerable, that we cannot listen to, we cannot hear, um, the better 
to perhaps collapse certainties, to perhaps co to collapse these sorts of authoritative uh, claims, and to reveal that certain attacks are themselves a declaration of weakness, paradoxically, um, particularly the most violent ones. Um, and if we can, in a sense, put our own foot behind the kick that comes towards you, in the sense of kind of un, you know, balancing, destabilizing um, the aggressor. So philosophy, therefore, could be seen perhaps as a kind of judo, as a sort of defensive martial art. Um, and I perhaps prefer this um, thought to the idea that philosophy is a sort of demented uncle hiding while others go about their business. And this relates specifically uh, to a description by uh, Badiou, which is otherwise quite a, a delicious description um, from 2001 in an essay on the war against terrorism. Badiou says the following, the duty of philosophy um, is to rationally reconstitute the reserve of the affirmative if infinity that every liberating project requires. Philosophy does not have and has never had as its own disposal the effective figures of emancipation. That is the primordial task of what is concentrated in political doing thinking. So philosophy is not politics directly for Badiou. Um, he says, instead, philosophy is like the attic, where in difficult times one accumulates resources, lines up tools, and sharpens knives. Philosophy, he says, is exactly that which proposes an ample stock of means to other forms of thought. This time, as in today, Badiou means, it is on the side of affirmation and infinity that philosophy must select and accumulate its resources, its tools, and its knives. Okay, so my version of the attic um, is not this room at the top of the house where the mad uncle is sharpening his knives. I, I'm sorry, Badger is not a mad uncle. That's very, very unfair. Sorry, Badger. Um, but rather, perhaps, um, attic uh, in, a, in a gross uh, etymological slip uh, in the Greek sense. <laughs> so, Greek, <laughs> Greek tragedy. This another attic. Um, so, in, in the sense of, of kind of what Socrates was doing in a certain sense, so, so like the kind of Socratic uh, uh, judo that he performs, basically undermining those, for example, who would seek to uh, shove people in jail uh, in Euthyphro, for example, um, the idea that, you know, those who, those who know what it is to punish and who should be punished and what they should be punished for um, can be kind of challenged um, by kind of the, the judo kick that kind of destabilizes them because they're the ones rushing towards uh, action and decision or towards you. Um, so perhaps we should all get fitter. No, I don't know. It's maybe conceptually, physically, same thing apparently. Um, is that what I'm saying? Okay, but philosophy is from the beginning, of course, like if we're thinking about the defense of philosophy now as such, and not just philosophy as self-defense, but a kind of how do we protect philosophy itself from all of the incursions and violences that are performed on it. And, and obviously that means everything from the closure of philosophy departments um, to the destruction of thinking as such. Um, so philosophy, in a sense, all, always and also has to differentiate itself very carefully and cleverly from those things that look a bit like it. Um, so obviously, uh, sophistry, the sophists, you know, those who accepted money for thought, that taught rhetoric and so on, uh, kind of key, key sort of uh, anti-philosophical figure um, right from the beginning. Also from doxa, so the opinion of the day, how do we separate out philosophy from that's just what you think, man, um, as people say endlessly. Um, from commerce, you know, the idea that one can commercialize thinking. You know, of course, we live in an absolutely uh, dominant commercial age. Everything has its price. Everyone has its pri everyone has their price, etc. Um, so, how do we then be very careful to 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 preserve something like a space and a time, which might include the destruction of state time, um, from all of these things that are, are constantly trying to. Uh, um, you know, intervene into, into philosophy. And what then am I saying uh, philosophy is? Um, metaphysics is a kind of Kampfplatz, a battlefield, Kant tells us uh, in the 18th century. Um, so philosophy is here perhaps only just uh, a, a sort of a sidestep away from all of these other things. I want to say, I don't want to say that philosophy is this kind of a uh, grand, epic, kind of beautiful palace. It's, it's not. It's a kind of empty field uh, in which there's a sort of small stall selling you lemonade uh, on the side. 
not sure where I'm going with this. And then there's a man in the corner who's trying to tell you something else. And uh, Miss Lee, I don't know. OK, so philosophy here is only just on the side of something else. It's, it's only just one step away from certainty, uh, from money, from madness, uh, from nihilism, from opinion. Um, and it's trying to do something very, very subtle in a certain way in the name, perhaps, of things like truth, beauty, and justice. And indeed, perhaps what, asking those questions about what those things truly are uh, in a certain sense. I mean, at least this is the, the, the model from Plato. So philosophy's indifference to public opinion, to the market, to the use of numbers, um, to the idea that places and words are meaningless or interchangeable, and of course we live in the, the regime of exchange, uh, without question, uh, the exchangeability of, um, of, 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 of money for things, of things for things, of things for people, of people for people, and uh, by all accounts, contemporary uh, dating is a lot like this, if you, you know, on your phone or something like this. I don't know. I don't do that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so... Oh, yes, okay, so right, so this kind of idea of, of all of these things that we're, we're trying to very slightly separate ourselves from, uh, maybe also by going through them, actually, there may be forms of madness that one has to enter into, in fact. Um, so it's not like philosophy uh, can preserve itself from the outset, in, indeed, from all of these things. And indeed, to be paid to be a philosopher or to teach philosophy, one should say, already puts one, uh, oneself on the side of, of sophistry by, by definition. Um, Points, but what philosophy perhaps points to paradoxically is a certain strength of the nothing, of, of, of the, the nothing that is not these things, right? So what is it, what is it to be an, a non-thing uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, not, to not be countable, um, to not be exchangeable, um, and so on? Um, so this doesn't mean, though, necessarily a certain kind of asceticism. And I think there's a kind of Christianized way of thinking about what it means to withdraw from the world, um, which isn't quite exactly what I mean. It's not a withdrawal from the world. It's, it, it is, um, if anything, a more of a way of being in the world, of being more in the world uh, in a certain way. Um, but here we are talking, and I, I'm sort of coming to the end in a certain way, about... about um, how we defend philosophy, the defense of philosophy against its enemies, so against anti-thought, against the manipulation of thought, against the kind of promotion and projection of confusion which we see everywhere. Philosophy or thought, I want to say, is something that everybody can and does do. It is not an elitist uh, thing. It is not something... Uh, it's something that belongs to everyone. It re requires no official training, no money, only a little time and a little space. Um, you can do it on your own. You can do it with others, better with others. It's more fun. Um, but precisely, it's this little time and space that is, perhaps, that is what is absent and destroyed today, and, and destroyed today in every place and every time. And in a sense, that's the kind of defense of philosophy that somehow we need to preserve. So like a conversation with a friend for no reason, for no purpose, an excellent conversation, what, what an excellent thing to do, to walk around a park with a friend, um, can be seen, therefore, as a form of resistance. And, but I understand, of course, that we're playing very uh, trickily with this, again, with this question of urgency, of quietism, of you know, potent, what is the potential for simply remaining in one, one's place when all around you violence is happening, uh, where the state is doing things uh, that you might you know, need, in fact, to protect others from, uh, and so on. So it's a very, very different difficult balance um, and it is always a question of balance and and the way in which one oneself might be punished in fact for standing up by the state but also by other other people um, so dialogue then might be as it always was a kind of method and a strategy in a certain sense um, to think calmly and slowly and as outside as possible and the, and the kind of place where one thinks is sort of where I want to to end um, no, so against the enemies of philosophy, of those who insist that one must not think lest one transgress, um, must not dispute lest one causes harm, for example, to know one's own mind, even paradoxically, as this might mean scrubbing it of previous knowledge, um, to be led apparatically down the path where we question all of our certainties, um, to suffer confusion but not to remain confused, to push one's own minds to the limits, perhaps, and there are various different ways of doing this. So the self and the idea of self-defense that I'm talking about today is not the self of the state, the self of identity, of the passport, 
but rather the self that determines to put itself on the line outside of comfort, and this self might be a body as well, and it might be this, you know, this combination of th thinking and being and inhabiting a body. How one uses one body, one's body is also a matter of thinking, great thought. Um, to paradoxically, in a certain sense, to become wise, the better to become wise. And when we think about what philosophy means, you know, we could translate as love of, love of wisdom. And what does it mean to become wise then, uh, in this sense, to, to not only love wisdom, but to sort of seek to inhabit uh, wisdom? And wisdom, of course, might be uh, the idea that one knows nothing, in a sense. It may be a kind of relation to the nothing or to the void. It's not uh, necessarily a positive set of, of knowledges that one has. So it is not the self, of course, of a consumerist identity, or of an immediate direct actor, necessarily, but the self as a kind of non-self, a non-self that, that also unites us collectively in the face of the state, which seeks to kind of enumerate and, and to identify. This is the self that philosophy defends, an empty self that is also a collective being, the capacity to think together, to talk together, to decide together, how we must live together without the state, the state which has become this kind of opposing entity over and above us, and to live and to think autonomously, um, and to rethink the relationship between thought and action and also between space and time. So thinking, again, is not opposed to action, but action without thought uh, runs many risks. And I just want to pose a final question um, to everyone. When Plato in the dialogues that when they discuss particular concepts and particular topics, they do it in particular places, and it's very, very deliberately done. So the drinking parties where you discuss love outside the city walls is where you, well, sex really, but different stories about sex and love. Outside the city walls is where you discuss true love in the Phaedrus, um, so the symposium, the drinking party in the Phaedrus. Um, on, the, on the steps of the courtroom is where you discuss justice and so on. Um, so I want to ask, where then can philosophy discuss violence? Or where is the best place, in a sense, for philosophy to reflect together on this question of violence? Because, of course, violence itself seems to oppose thinking. Violence seems to be the opposite of philosophy, the opposite of thought. We can, of course, talk about the violence of the concept and all of those sorts of things. And there may be forms of violence that are a constitutive or internal to thinking. You know, and, of course, there is a whole line of thinking uh, you know, Frankfurt School and, and others who, who will discuss precisely the violence of the concept. But the kind of philosophy um, that I want to talk, talk about here is, is in a sense, uh, comes before, in a sense, concept uh, creation in a certain way. It's more a kind of way of simply being uh, and talking and reflecting and, and thinking. Um, so I kind of want to leave it as an open question. Can, we, can philosophy discuss violence in the art gallery, let's say, um, or is what I'm doing a form of like meta uh, philosophy? Um, or can we discuss, um, perhaps in the prison cell, where one is alone, or perhaps one is with another, if you're lucky, um, in the woods uh, or in our hearts? Um, in any case, I want to sort of uh, echo um, what Vanessa is saying, coming from a very different um, sort of approach and, and discourse and um, relation to politics. Um, but, but in a sense, the outside. I mean, what, what we mean when we talk about the outside, it can mean so many um, different things. Um, you know, and what it means to think inside the empire, inside the, the, the state, uh, you know, and, and, and inside the police state, to be able to think uh, outside whether or not we can literally get outside the state, um, but to nevertheless be somewhere uh, beyond its, uh, its capture. Okay, the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina, for that calm reflection as you label the <laughs> philosophy. It's a performative contradiction. No, what? Is this on? It should be on. Uh, yeah, probably. Is it on? I put it on, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I'm just being ridiculous. Um, yeah, no, I know. Do you, like, do you like the manic defense of calmness? It's good, isn't it? Pardon me? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm just being <laughs> do I like the what? I said, well, it's like, it's like a sort of funny performance, isn't it? Because I'm like speaking in this slightly manic way about being calm. <laughs> Don't worry. Pun intended, yeah. <laughs> um, you asked the question I wanted to ask, um, listening to your talk actually yourself, or you um, sort of got close to it, I think, and this would be, um, what would non-state time look like? And are we now in a situation of non-state time? You actually asked that question when you said, can we do philosophy in an art gallery or a museum, uh, which would be the case here. Um, 
And yes, can you answer the questions? That question for yourself, actually, can we do philosophy in a museum? Well, and I mean, what would non-state time look question. like? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that the more specific question I want said at the end was, you know, can philosophy discuss violence in the art gallery? So mm. the question is really, you know, obviously we, we know that violence is kind of, you know, everywhere on all levels in a certain sense and, you know, that one must act against violence in the moment or, you know, act collectively against various forms of violence. But, but it's, it's more, you know, that kind of question about, well, if we... If it makes sense, or if there is a certain context to where we think and where, there's, where we speak, which of course there is, um, is there a sort of a more appropriate place, if you like, to reflect on violence, I suppose? And I left it as an open question. That's why I didn't answer it. But um, <laughs> if I had to answer it, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, we, of course we could discuss violence on a protest, for example. Like, if we're kettled by the police, I mean, this is as good a time as any to discuss violence, let's say. You know, and, and in a sense, there is no privileged or particular place. If violence is everywhere, then, then violence can be discussed everywhere. So that means, or would entail, if I got you uh, right here, that non-state time actually has more to do with space, right? That the space uh, must be different from, or must be shielded from all the influences you stated in your talk. And that in those alternative spaces, or shielded spaces, or safe spaces, you could say, today, that this non-state time could actually evolve. Yeah, I mean, we live in a very complicated uh, relation between space and time. I mean, like Bergson will talk about the spatialization of time in a certain way. You know, time itself is, of course, like generally clock time. It's kind of measured time. You know, it's not the time of uh, any sort of like deeper rhythm or, or of nature. You know, we, we have a profoundly unnatural conception of time, um, which plays out in our own lives and in our own bodies, right? So we don't live uh, it w whatever a natural relation to time might be. And obviously, the invention of the calendar and, and of Stonehenge and, and so you know very anyway uh, let's, go, no, let's not go into the calendar thing I'll like talk too much about it but okay so I mean first of all we might have to think about the relationship between space and time so like we also don't necessarily have a relation to particular places like there are no sacred places in a certain sense like we've had it we have a totally you know non uh, sort of post-enlightened, you know, kind of disillusioned, disenchanted, you know, non-sacred relation to place. You know, I mean, obviously, capitalism is brilliant at this, right? It kind of makes everything... You know, I'm not defending it. I'm saying it's a bad thing, yeah? So, like, it, it kind of, like, destroys all specialness, yeah? There's no specialness anywhere, right? And, and even the kind of the idea of the museum, I mean, this is in Chris Marker's film, films, you know, what do you do when you, you know, you gather up sacred objects, objects of ritual, speculation, of devotion, and you put them in a room, you kind of completely desacralize them, you kill them, you kill the statues, you know, um, for example. And so, so the question of like what it might mean to carve out a sacred, and this is like Bataille's question, for example, it's a question for the College of Sociology in the 1930s, of how to have like a left sacred as well, because the sacred will always re-emerge politically, um, you know, because once, if you kind of get rid of it, it will come back as a desire. Um, you know, what it might mean to carve out uh, sacred places, you know, like, is sex a sacred place, for example? Like, are there kind of moments of, like, experience? And again, this is a very 60s concept. I've been reading loads of R.D. Lang and these, like, psychedelic anti-psychiatrists, you know, very influential on Deleuze and Guattari. But, you know, these kinds of places and times where those questions of space and time become something very different, like maybe, maybe place is intensified and time is dissolved or something like this. You know, that one no longer has a kind of teleological relation to what one must do next. Mm. So let's say a no longer a non-anxious relation to time in which one is like, does and says whatever one, one wants, you know. You made a very inspiring and large jump, I think, from uh, Deleuze Guattari, again, from uh, uh, Mille Plateau to the identifiability of today to social media today, right? You have made this jump to self-policing on social media today. Yet, uh, there is also, or there could be the tool of um, what people call in anti-surveillance uh, circles, obfuscation that you like things you hate, for example, that you click things you're actually not conforming with to sort of uh, um, yeah, obfuscate your traces. You could stage your photo. It has a lot to do with um, 
self-styling, you can change it, you can actually do something with it. Don't you think there's more potential of subversion actually in social media than Deleuze and Quattari foresaw? I mean, I can definitely see what you're saying there with this jump, but I think on social media there's, there might be other options or offerings to do than just be self-identifiable. Um. I think, I mean, this gets into a very, like, very tricky question about levels of reality, because obviously mm. on some, in some way of thinking about it, whatever you do online is sort of doesn't particularly matter, right? Whether you click like to obscure what you think or you don't, I mean, in a sense, who cares? It's all on the same plane, right? It's all in the same space, right? The space of onlineness or the internet. You know, it's, it's like, it's one thing, it's one attempt to kind of hijack reality and create a reality. It's a reality that we, we spend time in, most of us, you know, it's very hard not to. If you, if you have a job and you have an email account, you have to go on a computer. It's awful, you know. There are some sort of older professors in the UK who, like, refuse to use email, and I, I have, like, profound respect for these, for these people. Um, you know, because there is a, there is a kind of like assumption, and that and, you know that one must. You know, how can you not? How can you not be online? You know, it's are you are you are you mad? You know, um, but so in a sense, there are kind of maybe forms of opposition. Yeah, and I mean, I do I do sort of think actually this is a bit speculative that there will be a kind of mass turning away from these things actually in the name of a, a sort of. Yeah, an, an offline life, you know, what does it mean to have real experiences, you know, is it, is it still possible, you know, to have, to ha you know, for a, there is a desire for the non-mediated, I mean, you see this at various points, you know, in, in, in terms of like raves and in terms of kind of collective, uh, you know, behaviours where people get together, you know, um, to do something different, to do something that which, is, which isn't prescribed, which isn't what the state says you're allowed to do in order to enjoy yourself, which is like get drunk, smoke, you know, feel ill, feel terrible, you know, like all those things that are allowed, you can do something else. And, and But obviously the moment people start trying to do something else and new, it gets shut down, you know, so like repetitive beats get banned in the UK, like... That also includes like marching drums, as someone pointed out. But anyway, so the army is also banned. But what they meant was, you know, they they wanted to ban raves, rave music because it was like, you know, uh, bad because people were doing things that banned, were fun. Banned from where? Huh? Banned from where? Banned, just banned. So the criminal justice bill. It, and the 80s. It's, okay, it's, I was going to yeah, say the 90s. The so criminal justice bill is like so. I think it's 94. They banned repetitive beats. Oh really? That was that, yeah, yeah. That so a joke. Okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because people were listening to, like... Well, to that rate. worked out uh, very good.